Hey. And here we are, just outside the castles of Babylon, where King Berkey and his little jester badger like to stroll around, looking at board games that were planted in the years gone by, and seeing which of these are still standing in the woods of Evergreen. Hey, it's the Berkey and Badger. It's not the board game babble show. It's the Woods of Evergreen. Yay, our mini, mini, mini kind of podcast where we talk about some of the great games which still sit on our shelves and still get played from those years gone by. They're actually trees that we've planted. We're going to actually name some trees. Yeah, if I had, that's a good idea. If I had a garden as big as yours, sire. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we started doing this a little while ago just as an opportunity for us to get together and do a short segment and and be a little bit more board game centric. We do so many fun things on the Berkey and Badger Board Game Babble Show where we talk about the news and we have guests come in and all kinds of uh, the babble topic where we're talking about things. But this is actually really getting into some board games. And we had this idea to create games from yesteryear that basically still stand the test of time. And what was the year that we started with? 2005, me thinks. You're making me dig into my Google Drive and look <laughs> at back at the Berkey and Badger notes and bits and bobs. List of Evergreen. Here we go. Yeah, it was 2005. 2005. That's... Uh, was kind of a good starting point because that's that was a point when I started getting into the greater hobby in a in a bigger way uh, for myself. But I got thinking about some games that were produced before that. So we might, when we circle around, once we get up to 2020 and we circle back, we might be able to even circle back a little bit further, mm -hmm. you know, maybe even to 2000 or something like that. Of course, we don't have the plethora of options that we have prior to 2005 that we have now. Uh, interesting, 2013. Yeah. What a year. It was a year. Hey to Todd. Hey, how you doing, Todd? Uh, so good to have you join in the chat. I think this is just kind of a cool, uh, every time we do this and we look back and it's like, oh, that's one of my favorite games. Oh, yeah. that was the really favorite game. And I started looking at my list and I went, man, there's some friggin' awesome games in 2013. And we're only going to talk about three of them each. Mm. Yeah, so, so it's lucky we, I called up that Google Drive because I was able to just type in mine there. So all I have to do is find out what your three are and I type them on there. So we know next time we come back around to 2013 that we're not going to say these games again ever. Because there's so many, uh, it's hard to remember. Um, but I was really impressed with 2013. I got to tell you, this was a fantastic gaming year. Yeah, it was a game, good gaming year for baby napping as well. Oh, oh. yes, baby napping. <laughs> and how how many papas and mamas are at home now watching children? That's a, well, that's me anyway. That's me. My wife's gone back to work, so I have the duty of looking after the kids and you know, putting like Hanukkah on the bruises and bumps and that they, they get into and scrapes. Well, that's the little one, not the big one. The big one doesn't do that. <laughs> so, so now you're doing the podcast. So do you have a uh, little Robin uh, duct tape to the wall or something right now? I have indeed. And I've chucked flour all over his face and um, that hides all the bruises very well. <laughs> I, actually, I actually cut his hair as well. I that, saw you cut his hair. That looked actually really good. It's not too bad until you get close and then you see like this one side burn is down here and the other side burn is not. And then he's got like a little tuft here, which is longer than the rest of it. And it's like, but it's cool. He looks like a, like a punk from an 80s film. So <laughs> oh, I bet you're having a lot of fun with him, though, too. We're having lots of fun. I'm enjoying this. Yeah. But anyway, we diverse. Let's jump right into it. Yes. Ah, Napalm the Verbos. 
says, ha, one benefit of distance education is that I can be alone in my classroom at the right time to catch this live. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so you can teach and listen to podcasts at the same time. That's what Kabuki will be doing as well, probably. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway. Well, it'll be fun. We kind of posted this a little bit uh, spur of the moment, so we didn't do a lot of advertising the show. But let's start right into what your first game uh, these are not necessarily our favorite game from 2013, but it's ones that we feel stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. I picked some games that I thought maybe you wouldn't pick just so it would shake it up a little bit because I know a couple of your favorite games from 2013. But yeah. why don't you go ahead and start out? So I'm going to start with my favorite game from 2013. Can, can I guess what it is? You can guess what it is. Um. I think, were you going to explain it first or were you going no, to? No, no, you can guess it if you want. Um, I think it's Viticulture. What, this this box down here? <laughs> Which looks like that. Ta -da! It is indeed Viticulture. This is uh, a game which has withstood the test of time, even though it's only like, what, seven years? Seven years. Right. Seven but years, do you yeah. believe that? Seven years? Yeah. But probably make that six years because that's Kickstarter, and then you got to wait a year for the Kickstarter to arrive, true. <laughs> and then you can play the game. <laughs> so, yeah, true that. So yeah, Viticulture is a game that uh, still gets played. It's a game that I probably never, ever, ever, ever will part my side because it is a perfect worker placement game. Uh, the base game itself is uh, a pretty standard game of you know placing your guys out into different positions to perform an action on your turn um but if you've got the expansions it expands the game immensely and actually takes it beyond the base game the base game is fun it's kind of like light medium weight ish but then the expansions take it into medium weight to heavy in between well i wouldn't say it was heavy but medium weight and slightly heavier uh with all the different different little things and bits and other ways to get points in the game because the base game has a little way of getting points you know you're, you're making champagne you'll or wine or uh or roses and you're selling them to get your points where is everything else in the the expansions gives you points in other ways you can get lots more points by selling just the wine individually without doing a contract you can also sell um uh, you can get points i've i've gone blank this is my favorite game and i've gone blank on some of the the, the rules but you can get points from selling stuff building stuff um there's buildings which will give you points now you uh, have the tuscany tuscany expansion or yeah the, Tus the, the new essentials version the tuscany expansion i have um which has nine different expansions in it and they are all gradually gradually better and better as the more you add in yeah because uh, now you have the you have the great big uh meeple what do you call that guy that lets you do two actions uh, yeah, the grand, the grande, yeah, grande, yeah. That's, that again, that's just not a nice rule to break. You know, the the mold of normal worker placement games. It's it's very practical, it's very fun. Um, it's it stretches out as well with the expansions as well because you're basically breaking it down into two phases per round in the yep. base game. But with the expansions, you have four phases per round, uh, which you know gives you a lot more time to you know think a bit more about how you're going to use your workers because you only got a limited amount and if you use them all in say the springtime you're not going to have any left for the autumn and the autumn is important because you need to do a recult harvest, a harvest to and then, and then you've got that tension of that rooster too of whether you want to go up and take a you know a, yeah be a the first player of each phase yeah that's going to give you more and there's that tension of am i mm. going to get what i want yeah and as i said there's so many different ways of getting points it's ridiculous you don't have to sell wine to to win the game you can get win the game in other ways which is great so um that's a game which i really enjoy playing a nice good hour worth kind of fun you know i can play this with the family and i do play this with the family i've played six player recently as well which was really oh. good as well so um yeah, it didn't it didn't drag on too long. Really, really recommend it. If you like worker placements games, this is probably one of the best ones 
And when uh, you think about the components of the game, um, the components absolutely stand the test of time. That That's a beautiful production. The it wooden, is. wooden components, the little clear uh, beads that you put over the wine that you can see through to see the, you know, the evolution of the wine process and yeah, uh, it, the artwork. It, it's fantastic. Yeah. I think with time that, that uh, I can see some improvements that can, could be done with the, uh, the components like now, like the, the, as you say, the glass gems, which keep stock of what your wine value is and what your grape value is. Yep. They, they move about a lot. So again, the kind of like the recess boards would be, quite practical there or yeah that's some true. other some other way of, of of keeping the count but as you say Eric, there, there's so many different components each with their own individual um style look that it's uh, pleasing to everybody well that that's uh stonemeyer games you know jamie stegmeyer alan stone and uh, what a fantastic design that uh, jamie stegmeyer came up with and mm -hmm. really launched a lot of his future projects that have become so popular and uh they they just do an awesome job right yeah they do indeed so well, i have one of your babies um this is probably one of our family's favorite games um i do not recall a time ever that we've played this game that everybody didn't just think it was fantastic and many of you know my son Josiah is is just incredibly sharp when it comes to playing any type of Euro games. He generally figures it all out way ahead of us, and and he really generally leaves us in the dust. And so, playing a game with him that has some kind of dice mitigation usually helps us compete with him. But in this particular game, um, we found that we're all so close. There's so much uh, going on in this game that it's always fresh every time we play it. And we always have this amazing experience. Uh, the game has been knocked for its cover. Ah. A lot of people feel that the artwork of the cover was just really bad. Do you know what I'm thinking about? I think you're thinking about Concordia. That's what I'm thinking about. Oh. Real Grand Games, Concordia, baby. Look at that. In all of her glory, sitting there, I I kind of agree that the art is so so, but I never felt you know I'm seeing her out here with some merchants and things like that. It, it, it's a Max Gertz game from Real Grand Games. There's been several expansions that have been made to this game. Um, the artwork really didn't bother me. It's in this odd shaped box, which is always mm -hmm. difficult to store. Um, but I have all the expansions uh, for this game, the salsa expansions, the different maps that are available. Recently, they just came out with the new Italia. Uh, there, there's just so many amazing things about this game. And one of the things that I love about this game, you know, it's got these beautiful maps where you're running around and you're trading and you're trying to build these, you know, outposts and you're trying to... Uh, you, you have this really unique player board that's in front of you where you're collecting these resources, you know, and these resources can be brick or it can be wheat, iron, wine, or silk. You're grabbing all these things. Well, I have all of the tricked out components from Jamie Stegmeyer, the, the two, the, uh, oh, what do you call those? I just lost it. Oh, treasure oh, chests. Yeah, the treasure chests. Yeah. And so I've got the little silk bundles, and we've got the little wine bottles and all kinds of cool stuff. But you have these regions on the map up here that allow you to do different things based on the cards that you have. And these cards are in your hand, and you play that action selection card that allows you to do something. Mm -hmm. um, well, you need to know when to play that card. You have other cards that will copy that card, um, you know, and then you have, have the merchant card. So you can kind of go up there and reset and get extra cash so that you can buy or trade with your merchant cards. Uh, you have the these other cards that allow you to buy additional cards that are up on the top. And all of these cards are different factions. Well, by collecting sets of these factions, they will multiply your end game scoring, but it's super hard to tell what your opponents have in their hand and how those points are going to actually 
accumulate at the end. Mm. So it's not like a euro that has perfect information for everyone, unless you're really incredibly identical. Mm. Um, and so the end game is always so exciting. You can see where people are getting to other cities. If you can get to the city first and get your house there first um, by paying those resources, it's going to cost you less. The second person to go there is going to cost you more. So there's a lot of strategy of where you're going, and there's a little bit of a race and tension that's there. Um, the expansions make it that much better. Um, that card play, and then finally you play your Tribune, which allows you to reset and get all those cards back into your hand and the new cards that you've collected mm -hmm. uh, that you may or may not have played, and the, knowing when to reset that hand so that you can get these other cards, your colonist uh, pilgrim cards that allow you to move your guys around. And there's, there, I'm, I'm being so generic with the rules here of what's happening, but always an amazing experience. Um, we love Concordia. It's I, I cannot recommend Concordia enough. One of our favorite uh, all time family games and definitely within my top 10. Mm. Todd says it's on his must try list and it's on my must buy list It's a game that I've been trying to I've been wanting to buy because I've played it once it was like one of one of the first games that I played here in France and it was talked to me in French um, and I was like I don't understand this but as soon as I got the cards in my hand and I started seeing what people were doing boom I understood the rules um, it really easy to pick up probably as you say probably difficult to master but um, definitely fun. Um, it is fun just cycling through your hand of cards and then knowing when to. No, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna play that card and pick up my hand again and 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 play this power again. You because you could just like cycle through two cards, play two cards over and over again, or you can play through your whole hand and then get your hand back. But um, very enjoyable. Bit dull to look at, but the excitement and actually the pleasure of playing. So good choice. I like that. All right. All right. Hopefully the your second game. Yeah, my second game is one that you have played. Ah. I know that. It's a two-player game Ooh. which could have been well, it is basically an abstract game, but it has so much theme in its simple idea. It's an asymmetric game um where one player is the king like yourself and they are trying to get back to their castle and the other player is controlling the crowds of the oh. king's public but hidden in that public are some assassins kings yes. and assassins you taught me this game when we were in france yes i did this game is as you can see very very small it's two player only but this is a game which hits our table a lot especially when it's me and my daughter and she wants to play something she loves playing this game we play either side so one round i'm playing the king and then the next round i'm playing the assassins vice versa for her and it has a double-sided village board so you can change the game a bit and change how you strategize but it is such a simple idea where uh, one player will have about 10 uh, peasants or villagers. They will choose three of those to be assassins, but the king won't know who they are. The king has his guard around him, and so he has to make his way to the entrance of the castle. And this is done with some card play. There's a small deck of cards. You reveal one, and it will tell you how many moves the king and the soldiers can make and how many uh, villagers can move at the same time. And so you'll take turns going between yourselves. Okay, you turn a card. I can move this, this, this. You can move that, that, that. And you strategize on how you're going to get through and when you want to reveal your assassin, who is quite nimble. So think Assassin's Creed, but the board game. And there's um, that hidden, hidden element of and misdirection that you can employ when you're moving your parts. Because you might move a guy over there thinking, okay, that's his assassin, but it's just a diversionary tactic to get the actual assassin closer to the king and in a position to strike. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of bluffing, a lot of back and forth. Um, really enjoyable. It's it's one of those games that we'll probably take we take on holiday. Um, a game that, as I said, me and my daughter play quite a bit. It's going up my list on BGG of the most played games that I have. Um, really enjoyable. 
and there is a, a special version out as well recently come out a couple of years ago with actual figures instead of standees um it looks nice i don't know if i would replace this version with it because uh, you know the art is quite easy to tell the difference between the different peasants the peasants i keep saying peasants that's me the peon. <laughs> but um a fantastic game definitely if you're into two-player games it's a perfect game for an isolation as well <laughs> yeah, and it plays pretty quick. You know, it's 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 pretty easy to grab a hold of it and and whip out a couple games of it if you want. You can play yeah. it half an hour, forty minutes. You know, yeah. so that's one of my, that is definitely an evergreen title for me. Yeah, good good. King choice. and Assassins. Kings and Assassins. Who makes that again? Um, my version is Rune Editions, but the original version is by Galactica. 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 Close. Galica. All right. Well, my next game, likewise, is best played, in my opinion, as a two player game, but it can be played as a four player game where you have two teams of two. Uh, it comes from one of my favorite companies uh, out there, and uh, they make games that are educational games. Mm -hmm. And I have loved. Uh, the games that they have come up with, such high quality games. But when we first picked up this game, my son and I immediately fell in love with this game. Uh, we played it and played it and played it. Now, recognize that my early game playing back when I was in high school was playing Risk, was playing Axis and Allies, was playing Fortress America, playing Shogun, you know, uh, some of those type of games that had a lot of area control. This game has area control, but it has such a unique uh, mechanism with card player and, and features that you can use your cards and this incredibly uh, cool cube pulling from a bag. This was very, very unique at the time, 2013, and it comes from a, game, a company that specializes in academic games. Nah, so okay. it's ah, yeah, one of our previous sponsors. Yes, correct. And I presume that it's uh, Freedom the Underground Railroad. No, no, no it wouldn't be. It's close. It, it, 1842, no. 2057. This is the game 1775 <laughs> from Academy Games. Mm, there you have it. And uh, 1775, it's just this, it, you know, it's got that element of the dice chucking, you know, where, where you're, you're actually using dice to find out if you actually have hits or not. So there's this strategic element of moving along the map and con controlling these areas. But you have these awesome cards that allow you to do different things. You know, you've got the Benjamin Franklin card. You add four French into Savannah, Georgia even if it's occupied. So there's things like the, the, these special cards that allow you to do things in different areas. So there's this fog of war element that's going on. There's area control going on. But then there's also this, this unique cube system where you have these generic type of indigenous cubes that from different peoples that people groups that are actually in the countries that you haven't controlled yet. Eventually they can come alongside you. Uh, you've got the revolutionary forces. You then also have, uh, you also have the, the uh, you know, the Britain's forces. Um, it's just such a fantastic game. Uh, we play this game. We used to play this just over and over and over again. And I don't know, it's, it, it's fine with four people. We've had two teams really enjoy the discussions of what to do when you're playing teams, but then you're, you're kind of like two people will go away and go la, 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 and then do a little <laughs> planning and then everybody gets back and, la, la, la. and it's so this, it does, it does play fine with four players. Uh, you play it two or four. Um, and I don't know, love that game. And I cannot believe that it was seven years ago already. Mm. Time flies, huh? That, yeah. Well, it was seventeen seventy-five. Yeah, one of my favorite two-player games, uh, seventeen seventy-five from Academy Games. Oh, so you have to wait for Josiah to come home, 
and then get out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, it for an obscure game, which probably is probably not well known, but it is a game that is constantly being played. We take it to our game groups. It works with everybody. It works with new people, people that are not used to playing games. When we have people around for dinner, that seems so long ago. But when we do have people around for dinner, we, we can get this game out quite easily and have a, a good old giggle. It's a party style game and it's very quick. And it's from uh, Moonster Games or or Cocktail Games. It's called Crossings. Crossings. Yes. Ooh. Did we not play this with you? Uh, it sounds familiar. Did you bring it bring it when you came to Minnesota? Possibly. Tell us a little bit about it. I'll, I'll really tell you a little it. bit about this gem here. Well, this is a game about gems. Basically, um, you'll place out some mushrooms in the middle of a magical forest in the middle of the table, and each mushroom will grow three gems of a random sort. You'll be pulling them randomly out of a bag and placing them on each. And then every player is a harvester. You're trying to collect the most points as possible, and you're basically pointing, pointing at people to – to. well, you're not pointing at oh, people. You're pointing yeah, at the yeah. mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, we did do that. Yeah, we yeah, did yeah. do that. So basically, yeah, on a count of three, everyone will point to a mushroom. And if you're the sole player to point at that mushroom, you get to collect the gems on it. If two people point to the same mushroom, nobody gets nothing. But then the mushroom regenerates gems. So if it's already got gems in it, it gets extra ones. If it's got none on it, it gets extra ones. And the game continues. But now people have collected and put them in their basket. You can actually steal in pre um, or on the next round you can actually point to a player and steal whatever mushroom gems they got in their basket and put it into your own basket there is this little safeguard that you can block instead of pointing at someone or pointing at a mushroom you can block which means that you've gone home and you've dumped the gems back into your safe which means that you miss out on a round but that's basically the game after the gems run out you count up the points and the points are a basic um each Different color gem has a different point value, but you can get different points if you have a certain set of three colors. So there is this kind of calculatory thing of like, where am I going to stick steal stuff from? Mm -hmm. But also, which gems do I need to make a good set to get lots of points? It's quick playing. It's easy, easy to get out, and it plays up to six players. Six players with five mushrooms. And this is a game which, as I said, hits the table so many times. I just really enjoy this. And this is a game which is never going to leave my forest because I like mushrooms as well. Yeah, I kind of remember, uh, too, and it's that little bit of anticipation, who's going to pick what, and yeah. kind of guess that a little bit. Yeah, it was fun. And it's a quick, quick filler category type game, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Yep, good More choice. Area. Mm. Yep. Well, my last game that I think stands the test of time. Um, this comes from one of my favorite designers. Um, there are three games that he designed that are are in some of my favorite games. I know he's designed other games too, but there's three particular ones I think of. This is the one that I think put him on the map. And when this game came out in 2013, it actually got quite a bit of acclaim. Not, not like some of the really big titles that we all know about but most people that played this game said this is an awesome game. And so it, it got a lot, of, uh, a lot of positive publicity to it. And one of the things that it did in its mechanisms that was really cool was it allowed you to make choices by placing your, your token there. And, but you could jump ahead of other people's to get an action selection, resources, or something like that 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 really was a lot of tension. Well, I do want to make sure I get that, but I need to get these things along the way because I cannot go back. I can mm -hmm. only go forward. And it plays in three different rounds. So do you know the game that I'm referring to? It's either Takaido, which would be Antoine Bowser, who's very, very popular, or it's Glenn Moore. And, and it, it's similar. 
similar a little bit in the mechanism, but it's the first one that I saw that employed this type of uh, mechanism in, okay. in the first part of the round. The game creates so much tension, but then later in the in the game, it uh, there's Todd Johnston has it correct. Aha, Francis Drake. Wow. I mean, I absolutely think this. It's one of my top ten games of all time. Look at the artwork on this map, and these you've got these ships, and you're colonizing and going. Out, um, out on this map, you can see up on the top here, uh, you're seeing those action selections that I'm referring to. Um, you are going in there and you're placing your, your cube on there. The first person to get there generally is going to get a little bit more than the second person. But you can jump ahead, uh, but you can never go back. And then you have to get eventually get to the dock and hopefully that you have collected enough resources, whether it's cannons or whether it's crew um, or other items that you're going to go down on your little journeys uh, to 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 collect uh, these 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 countries that are down here. You're going there and you're either going to fight against fortresses or you're going to have sea battles. Um you're, there's this really cool hidden bluffing uh, mechanism where you have these tokens that are rated from one to four and you put them down uh, and, and it's hidden information. And whoever has the number one, someone has a number two, well, the number one is going to get the first initiative there. Um, and so there's this guessing game of what your opponents are going to do. And then this game continually ramps up the first round, and then you do a second round, and then you do a third round, and you're getting cumulative points if you accomplish these several objectives. Uh, oh, and I got to say this, I've played it at all kinds of player counts, and I enjoy it at every player count, but when you play five players, the tension of being able to accomplish the things you need to accomplish to win all three of those objectives, excuse me, when you go down, uh, it's the, I mean, it's those moments that this game here is at the end of the game. We're all standing up. We're like, ah, we're all looking, <laughs> we're, everybody is just, yeah. And, and, and the tension of that is, is so exciting. Um, and not in a, not in a, it's always close. Uh, it, 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 I don't know how to explain it any more than that. The anticipation, the excitement, the feeling we get every time we bring it to the table. Mm. I just love Francis Drake. It makes me want to play it right now. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't actually jump up from the table when we play any of those three games that I've mentioned, but there is this real kind of heart racing fast. You're, you're, you're clenching your teeth at the table and you're going, I'm going to win this. I'm going to win this. And then someone snaps it away from you. But uh, yeah, great sensations. Yeah. And the, the designer that I'm referring to, his name is Peter Haas. Okay. And Peter Haas d uh, designed another game from 2013 called Triassic Terror. Um, I could have easily talked about that game. Uh, he also designed Royals. Yeah. Um, he's from Australia. I actually had the opportunity to meet him several years ago at BGG Con. Uh, he's a doctor, actually. And I just so enjoyed talking with him. Uh, it was it was one of those early moments when I was newer in the hobby, the greater board game hobby, if you will, and meeting a, a, a designer that I respected, having played his game, and then actually having this connection with him and just normal great guy, you yeah. know, but talking about how much it, it brought him so much joy for us to tell him how much we loved his game. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it was one of those moments where you connect with someone that you admire that was positive. You don't always want to meet your hero. <laughs> no. <laughs> but in this case, it was it was pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah. And I mean, 2013 then, by the look of the games that you have, uh, is an unusual year for box sizes. <laughs> right? Every one of those are weird. Every one of them. My, mine stack almost. Viticulture <laughs> is very chunky, but it's... um. It does. It's kind of like the same size as the King and Assassin box, which is which is good. 
Well, but, I think uh, this is this is the this is the time frame that that the Berkeys started really getting into the greater hobby, becoming aware of you know we started purchasing a lot of those Days of Wonder games and all those kind of things, you know, back in in two thousand five, and so we were playing a couple games a year that we would get that we mm-hmm. liked and we found out about them thought, Oh, this is cool. This is great. But not knowing what was really happening out there, mm. not going to any of the big conventions, not realizing this Renaissance of gaming. And, and it around 2012 is when it, that started for us where we started going, Ooh, we went to Gen Con. We started seeing all these amazing games and we're purchasing these games and playing them and not having a huge collection but having, you know, maybe having 20 or 30 games in our collection and going from, you know, that 30 games to 100 games. Yeah. Um, it all started right in this time frame because there's so many amazing games. But because we didn't have so many games, we played these games over and over. Over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of these, well, not a lot of these games, but this is the time that I met my good friend, Philip Tappy Mocket, a well-known uh, French board game reviewer. Yeah. He's, now work, he's now working for Trick Track, uh, which is woo, good for him. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is when I got to meet him and he fell in love. We fell in love, you know, and he would constantly be asking me to play these games. He'd be constantly trying to teach me these games. Um, and uh, that's how I, I found out a lot more kind of uh, French-based games, you know, the ones that weren't ge- in the general market, um, but um, obviously coming from the French publishers. And that was that was a, that was a great year. Um, yeah, King and Assassin was one of them because he put me in touch with his friend, Remy, who owns Rune Editions. And so, uh, yeah, it's all all good stuff and good memories 2013 there are as we say a lot more games what were your favorite games from 2013 what games are still sat on your shelf and you're still playing now which came out in 2013 and ones that you're never going to give away because they just they're just perfect i i can see a few other games which are on the 2013 lift over there and over there and i'm like i want to talk about them as well but we we we, we limited ourselves to 3 each Per show. And, and we purposely said these are this isn't by reason of our favorite games of 2013. This is games that we feel still stand the test of time. Mm-hmm. So we will be coming back to 2013 after a period of time and revisiting the games that 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 we still feel stand the test of time. That means that they are our favorite games of this year. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about him. But Napalm, he comes in and asks us uh, uh, some interesting questions. Of what are our top three? And he has some really good thoughts there. His number one game is a party game called Anomaly. He has a, his number two, the Council of Verona. Very see what he's saying there. Interesting. And then uh, number three, Walk the Plank. Oh. He also one. identifies Euphoria, one of one of my favorite games as well, um, and and then uh, it would be it would be really hard for me to categorize my top three. I don't know if we want to even go there right now. <laughs> um, do you want to go there with what our top three are? They are that they are my, some of my top three. Oh, you picked your top three, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I purposely didn't pick my top three because I thought we might have some crossover. And so I didn't do that. Like, Viticulture is definitely in some of my top. But if if I were going to – I didn't talk about a couple of them that I think are my top. Um, but if I, were, if I were doing, like, a top six, I would have to throw in Caverna. <gasps> Don't tell um, me. Caverna to me is way better than Agricola and one of my favorite games of all time. Don't say that. I I love Caverna. I just love it better than Agricola. Agricola is fine, but I love Caverna. I I absolutely adore the game Rococo. Uh-huh, yes. Such a fantastic game. Um 
I, I really enjoy Stefan Feld games, and one of my favorite Stefan Feld games is Bruges. Mm -hmm. So I love Bruges. One of my favorite games of all time, and for the longest time was my number one game, was Nothing Personal. Oh, yeah. From Tom Vassell and Steve Avery. And we had so many amazing, for years, every Father's Day, and on my birthday, we would play Nothing Personal. <laughs> Um, yeah, but then, you've got a mob family, so it's normal. Well, then we started <laughs> going to conventions, and especially Origins was on Father's Day. Mm. So all of a sudden, kind of got wrecked what was at home, you know, and then Game Toppers happened. And so now I'm working on Father's Day. So we it, it just went away. I haven't played nothing personal for three years. Wow. You know, but it was it was my favorite. Yeah. Um, so going there's back. some there's some games that I could add to the mix and trying to find out now, which of them are my top three. Mm -hmm. that, that's a tough one. Cause I, I would have to say Francis Drake is right up there. Um, but Concordia is right there. And I, I probably would, I would probably put nothing personal ahead of Caverna. Oh. Going back I, to Rogue Coco that you said, that's a I, game that I'm trying to play. I take it to game nights. I put it on the table when the wife wants to play a game and it still doesn't get played. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I want to play it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, Todd says, how many family members did you lose? I whacked them all, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something funny about our family playing that game. Sometimes take that games can create some some personal dynamics that aren't always positive. But for some reason, that game doesn't cause us to get too angry <laughs> with one another. And mm -hmm. we're, you know, the whole time, you know, I'm going to make them an offer that I can't refuse. You know what I mean? <laughs> you come to me on the day of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> you know, we get, we jump right into gangster character and everybody just has a blast. So, mm. One day that'll happen to me. Everyone will jump into character. <laughs> but it's just normally me, so. It's just you and your multiple I just jump personalities. Yeah, I jump into all my characters. Sybil. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, there it is. Games that from 2013, the woods of Evergreen that stand the test of time. Barry says viticulture. And he says kings and assassins. And he says crossings. Crossings. Uh, I say Concordia, 19, uh, 1775 Rebellion from Academy Games and Francis Drake. So we'll be back to talk about more uh, Woods of Evergreen. Our next segment will probably be in a couple weeks uh, for the year 2014. Yeah, that'll be a good year. Well, thank you all for joining us on this fun little time of looking backwards and seeing games that test that stand the test of time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Check out all our other podcasts and other bits and bobs on uh, Berkey and Badger at BoardGameTheater.com, BoardGamesEverybodyShould.com, or you can go to the Board Game Geek Guild 2248, uh, where I've just posted our last show as an edited audio podcast thanks for joining us guys and girls and uh we will catch you you can put up a poll even for the games of 2013 if you want oh, of course i will you know i will <laughs> so look out for that look out for that on board game geek see you later thank you all for joining we'll see you later We're so glad we had this time together And now it's time to go It won't be long until we have another show So keep us in mind, get online Berkey and Badger will be back in no time <laughs>